Hello, 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 and welcome once again to Movies That Pop. I'm the Colonel, and today we have a special edition of Movies That Pop regarding the X-Men movies. As we come off a huge opening weekend for Deadpool and look forward to X-Men Apocalypse roaring its way into theaters this Memorial Day weekend, let's take a look at the cinematic highs and lows of those uncanny X-Men. In a way, the story of the X-Men movies is the story of comic book movies in general. If you recall, by the late 90s, both Superman and Batman had seen their franchises run into the ground, and the only comic book movies being made were moody, over-stylized B-movies made for fringe audiences like Spawn, Judge Dredd, The Phantom, The Shadow, and Blade. In short, they weren't taken very seriously. It would be X-Men that would blaze the trail in this regard. Sam Raimi's Spider-Man was still a couple of years from showing that a comic book movie could be made that was earnest and fun with bright colors and easy to follow action. But X-Men, directed by Brian Singer, was the modest hit that made Spider-Man and pretty much the entire superhero resurgence of late possible. It had one foot in the old way, dark and broody design, overabundance of CGI and some cheesy one-liners, but it dared to use top tier talent to bring gravitas to the superhero genre that had been sorely lacking. Over the next 16 years, comic book movies have really come into their own, and through the genre's growth, the X-Men have remained a constant presence through sequels, prequels, spin-offs, reboots, and whatever the heck you'd call Days of Future Past. The X-Men have carried their particular freak flag high through the constant churn and change of the film industry. Let's see how they did it by ranking all of the X-Men films or films featuring X-Men since the year 2000. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Let's start with the ugly. After the X-Men series created its worst installment ever, an attempt was made to restart the franchise with a prequel, X-Men Origins Wolverine. The end result was even worse than the dung heap that necessitated it. A corny, overblown mess that took great pains to tell a story that we'd more or less gotten already. How Wolverine got his claws. Oh, and his name. And his jacket. Man, we did not need to know all of that stuff. Besides the cheesy special effects, paper-thin characters, and the ludicrous plot, the movie's biggest sin was including then all but wasting two big fan favorites. Gambit, who was reduced to a glorified cameo, and Deadpool. That's right, Ryan Reynolds got his chance to play the Merc with a Mouth all those years ago. Only in this movie, they sewed it shut. Seriously, it would take them seven years to remedy that mistake. At number seven, we have X-Men The Last Stand, the first film directed by someone other than Brian Singer, and the turning point for the franchise. In the hands of Brent Ratner, a series whose metaphors, you know, how being a mutant has been likened to being gay or transgender, or all of the social issues that come with that, had always been subtle. Now they crashed around like a bull in a china shop with the introduction of a cure for the mutant gene. New characters were introduced in haphazard fashion. The whole Phoenix storyline, which was highly anticipated, turned out being simplistic and melodramatic and, I mean, hey, she killed Professor X in what basically amounted to an overblown staring contest. And the action was uncharacteristically cheesy. Shoddy special effects work, a lame resolution summed up by an insipid final shot, broody, angsty narrative choices, majorly unnecessary deaths, and of course, this little nugget. Don't you know who I am? I'm the Juggernaut, bitch! Tactless and tasteless, X-Men The Last Stand would indeed be so bad and such a waste of great characters and opportunities that complicated narrative trickery would later be employed to literally erase its entire story from existence. But more on that later. This film stopped the franchise dead in its tracks, and it's only through a very long and complicated rebirth that the X-Men franchise would arise once again, like, say, a phoenix? 
At number six, we have the one that started it all, 2000's X-Men. This one is definitely a product of the times, plagued by an overabundance of the cheesy CGI and the muted color palette of the comic book films of the late 90s. But hey, it was a transitional period, let's cut it some slack. X-Men also has probably the weakest story of all of the films, and that's probably due to the insane amount of exposition required for newbies. Professor X seems more like Professor Exposition, as he begins the film with voiceover narration, then he spends about five minutes in the middle of the movie giving Wolverine, and us, a massive knowledge dump about mutants, who and what Magneto is, and what he wants, and what's going on at his school, and what Cerebro is. It it just stops the plot to a halt, and as I mentioned, there wasn't much of a plot to begin with. But the original X-Men deserves high marks for its casting. A very deep roster of iconic cinematic characters were created here that were built to last and continue to captivate audiences multiple films later. X-Men had a lot of pipe to lay for the franchise. I mean, just to introduce a dozen or more mutants and their powers and their backstories, it's pretty remarkable what it got done here. And as such, it's one of the least interesting movies to revisit, but its importance cannot be understated. X-Men showed us what a comic book movie done well could look like. It made the other X-Men films possible and kickstarted the resurgence of comic book movies that we still enjoy today. Number five is The Wolverine, yet another attempt to develop a solo adventure for Logan by sending him to Japan and with much more success. This one is heavy on the brooding drama. It is Wolverine, after all. And even though it gets a little noisy and bombastic at the end, tells a simple, grounded story that stands on its own. The movie's Japanese setting promises something tantalizing that it just doesn't quite deliver. That'd be ninjas. I mean, there are ninjas, but the one encounter Wolverine has with ninjas is not the full-on brawl that you'd have hoped for. There is that great chase slash fight scene set on a speeding train, though. Like I said, it does get a little silly there at the very end, but it did function as a pretty great individual chapter, like the standalone graphic novel that inspired it. Number four is Deadpool, the blood-drenched giggle fest that finally gave the beloved character his due, and actually makes a few meta-references to that fact. Click the banner above for my full review, but this one, as slight as a story as it tells, packs in so much giddy adult fun that it's easy to forgive its narrative shortcomings. This one also features some X-Men that we never really got to see very much of before, because as Deadpool jokes himself in the movie, including the more famous ones, would have been way more expensive. So let's give a little screen time to Colossus and Negasonic Teenage Warhead which turned out to be a great idea. Number three is the reboot X-Men First Class, a bold attempt to refresh the franchise without completely negating the previous movies and thus opening the door for the wild ride of days of future past. Here, we get younger, fresher versions of the main X-Men characters, excepting, of course, the ageless Wolverine. And just like the first X-Men, they're all brilliantly cast. Despite Going over some similar narrative ground, it even opens with a very similar scene to the opening scene in X-Men. It sets the action within the historical context of the Cuban Missile Crisis, and again demonstrates the ability to use these mutants as metaphors for the ills and moral responsibilities of human society. This kinda sorta reboot was just the shot in the arm that the franchise needed watching the strong relationships develop between McAvoy's Charles Xavier and all of the other X-Men, some of whom will become his greatest foes when the group ultimately fractures into opposing factions. It's compelling and fascinating stuff. At number two, we have X2, X-Men United. After all the heavy lifting was gotten out of the way in the first film, Brian Singer returned to really provide the first well-rounded, multi-character X-Men plot, and boy is it a doozy. X2 does what the best sequels do, built on the ideas of the first one, while forging a new plot of its own. Introducing interesting new characters, but providing new insights on characters you already knew. Along the way, the movie manages to create the most fascinating images and scenes of the entire franchise. The breathtaking opening sequence involving a mutant attack on the White House. Oh my God. The 
the nighttime assault on the school and its students. Magneto's ingenious escape from the plastic prison. Mystique's shape-shifting seduction of Logan in a tent. Nightcrawler's mid-air rescue that had entire theaters cheering. The glorious fate of Jean Grey and the perfectly subtle final shot that teased the Phoenix. It's all gold! And the best X-Men film is X-Men Days of Future Past. Woo boy! If this isn't a greatest hits package for you, I don't know what is. Brian Singer, who had directed the best X-Men films to date, returned. The young versions of the X-Men from the first class returned. The older versions returned. Everybody! Two Charles Xavier's, two Magnetos, Jennifer Lawrence, Hugh Jackman. Man, this thing must have cost a fortune. But if you ask any fanboy, it was money well spent. Because in addition to the full cast of characters you love, and in every version that you love them, there was a complex and compelling story being told. A tricky time travel plot that all worked and all paid off. And now, now talk about fan service, the events of this movie even erased the events of X-Men The Last Stand. <laughs> Done! Over! They're all alive again! I feel like Oprah. You're alive! And now you're alive! And now you, you sir, you're alive too! Plus, you had those cool Sentinel robots. You had Peter Dinklage. And what movie can't do without a little extra dink? There are some fun Charles Xavier mind tricks, including a, a great scene in which he talks to the future version of himself. And man, this movie has everything you could ask for. And many things you wouldn't even think to ask for, wrapped up in one mind-blowing, decade-spanning, apocalyptic epic. Woo! I really pity Brian Singer and company who have to somehow follow this act later this year with X-Men Apocalypse. <laughs> Good luck, guys. That does it for this special edition of Movies That Pop. If you have thoughts of your own about the X-Men films, please leave your comments below or click the thumbs up icon to indicate your approval. Also, be sure to click the icon right down there to visit our channel. You'll be able to see all of our other reviews, including the most recent one for Deadpool. And while you're there, you can do us a favor and click the subscribe button so you'll never miss a review. We'll be back next week with more reviews of all the latest movies. But in the meantime, thanks for watching. I'm the Colonel. And I'm the Juggernaut, bitch!